Welcome to a particularly cool uh, episode of the Perth US Asia Center's Foreign Policy Conversations. I'm delighted to be joined today by Renee Sayers, who is the Deputy Director of the Space Science and Technology Program at Curtin University, broadly known as the Research Ambassador for Curtin <laughs> University. Uh, and to those of you in the Perth US Asia community, you'll remember Renee from her star turn in 2018 at our, our In The Zone conference, where we focused on the zone above, on space, which is spectacular. And since then, uh, Renee really has been everywhere. She was on the, um, the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue in the, the winter of this year, just this past week on a, a panel on CETA, uh, there with the rest of the media looking at the launch of a, a satellite, the BNR satellite. And so we're really excited to have this conversation just because so much of what you do is inspirational more broadly in the community and has ties into our mission. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. That's no, so lovely. I'm, I'm going to ask you to recap some of the things we've talked about before. Your, your, <laughs> spa, your fireball desert network, your, I, I've yep. got the wording wrong. But I want to go back to something that I read in your bio, that, that your, your career as a research ambassador, and, and as, you know, again, you spent time at SciTech, again, a long now distinguishing career in the community here in WA. But it began with a, a 16-year-old letter to NASA. Tell us about that story. Uh, it, look, it's a good one because we actually work with them now. So it's a nice one to look back on, you know, uh, 16 plus years later. So, yeah, I, I, I was a young kid growing up in, uh, in Melbourne in the foothills of the Mount Dandenongs. And we had some really good skies. Um, and one of the things that I would always do was stargaze. Um, and I would always be annoyingly asking questions. Why, why, why? So they gave me lots of astronomy books, you know, space books all about our planets and our solar system as I was growing up. And one of the things I started doing when I got a little bit older was looking at the NASA websites. And I was fascinated about how stars and galaxies basically all came together under these the dance of physics and cosmology and, um, and philosophy. And so I just found that absolutely fascinating. And I stumbled across one day on the NASA websites, the Office of Space Science and Public Outreach. And I thought, oh, this is fascinating. These people going into the community sharing the, the joys of science and space and, and what it brings to community. Um, so I emailed them uh, at the office. I was like, what is this? What is it that you do? Um, and they shared that it was all about science communication, public uh, you know, education and public outreach. And so that's where I understood what that thing was, where you want to extend the reach of your research into the community uh, and bring the public along for the ride. And so that was, that was literally the seed. Um, and so they wrote back and they told me all about it. And then I went away and ran and ran away and I ran away and joined a science circus after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're far cooler than I am because I have to confess <laughs> that when I was a kid, I was also fixated on space. But but while you were looking at what, what how do you describe it? You know, the symphony of, of science and technology and physics. I, mean, <laughs> I was interested in the fact that astronauts drank Tang, this very sweet kind of breakfast drink. And so I wanted to drink Tang. That's kind of about, about where I topped out. So. Well, they're the ultimate role models, right? They are the extension of humanity off our planet Earth. And I just think that's amazing what astronauts can do and represent really brings so much humanity back down to us as well. So I want to get to the the more recent work that you've done with the satellite and some of the things we're going to talk about in a minute. But I want to go back uh, three years to the, the conversation we had early on. Uh, when you presented at the In The Zone conference, uh, you presented on a, a remarkable desert fireball network. And I think I may have got the phrasing wrong, but you'd give us kind of a, a, a quick recap of that project and a bit of an update, if you might. Absolutely. So the Desert Fireball Network uh, is the sort of seed that the Space Science and Technology Center grew from. So the Desert Fireball Network headed up by Professor Phil Bland. He came over here on a, a laureate fellowship from the ARC um, many, many years ago. And he built this network um, with a bunch of young guns and some amazing scientists and engineers. And effectively, these are disruption tolerant observatories kicked out into the desert. Uh, we cover a third of Australian skies and we're watching all night, every night. And what we're watching for are these bright meteors, these fireballs. And fireballs are incredible in the sense that they are often big enough upon burning up that there's still a rock that lands on the ground. So you're literally getting free samples from space. And so the Desert Fireball Network was able to connect these uh, free samples from space. We were watching them with our cameras. We were able to track and triangulate their pathway. So we could go to the desert or we could go where they land and pick up the rock. But really what we're able to do is put the geological context from these extraterrestrial rocks and wind the clock back and find out what their orbits were, their pre-Earth orbits. And those two bits of information 
as like a, the, the treasures. It's a treasure trove of a puzzle in unlocking these clues of our early solar system and solar system um, evolution. It's, it's, it's sort of like a um, cheat's way of sample return. You know, we go to these asteroids, we go to the moon, we're hoping to go to Mars and bring back samples. And we do that because it gives us geological context. And that's what the Desert Fireball Network does. It's still does. up and operating today. It certainly is. It's actually the Global Fireball Observatory now. We've been able to scale that up with our partners, with NASA, through the Solar System Virtual uh, Solar System Research Virtual Institute survey, um, and so it's these. There's cameras now. We had about 60 of them in Australia. We've now got 150 around the globe, um, and so that network extends around uh, around yeah around our planet as well. So, lest you think my misspent childhood was spent drinking nothing but Tang, <laughs> I was raised in the high deserts of Arizona, uh, and my home was about 3,000 meters in elevation, so very very high, and almost every summer night we would sleep out on the lawn and just count, you know, shooting stars. And they would just, okay, we call them shooter stars. We know what they are now, but they were just everywhere. And it wasn't until I, I moved to a city or to a lower elevation, even like we are right now, that I realized how fortunate we were to see those with such frequency without the technology. Now, um, Professor Bland and, and yourself and your team have really gone from strength to strength. Uh, so from that, you're now, we're in the news extensively this year uh, on your your big project tell us about binar oh yes yes okay, so binar we 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 do we we have a model of the binar one satellite the little cube sat here so this is a one to one of what's actually up in orbit right now um, it was just deployed from the international space station earlier this month uh, and it's western australia's first satellite and it's the first of many so we have uh cool. yeah it's very very cool <laughs> to break it there. it's very very cool oh my my uh, toddlers definitely had a go at this so um it seems it seems to be pretty sturdy so so yeah bina um so bina is the nunga word for fireball and it just touches on our origins you know as a research group and as a university cluster where we're uh, you know, cluster of, of, of researchers um together wanting to um take that heritage from the desert fireball network and apply it to space science and engineering. So the thing about throwing these uh, observatories out into the desert is they have to be really hardened and they're autonomous and it's very difficult to go out there and, uh, you know, touch up or get in contact with these, these systems. So we had to build them really ruggedly. Um, and getting them out there was really bumpy, similar to a launch, for example. So we had this heritage. Um, and so what we wanted to do is create a platform uh, to enable further research of our solar system. We see the Binar Space Program um, as a pathway. We have seven launches um, you know, in the coming years. The first one, obviously, was just this year. And all on the pathway, an R&D pathway to get us to the moon uh, and support the Artemis missions on a ride share um, yeah. for a twin orbit a mission called Binar Prospector. Um, so we really see this as, uh, as a tool for our further inquiry into our solar system. And we want to bring the public along for the ride. And we want to work with other researchers. We want to get Australian PIs on Australian missions. Uh, and, you know, we, we see that space missions and science is a really incredible gateway to be able to connect Australia with the begoning um, space sector we see. So, um the cool factor aside, I want to bring this back to kind of the work that we do here at the Perth mm. US Asia Center. Tell us a little bit about how you got Binar into space. What's the process? <laughs> Who are your collaborators in that endeavor? Oh my goodness, absolutely. Well, it's, firstly, it's very hard, very, uh, uh, very expensive, very long uh, process, but we did a few things along the way that allowed us to do this a bit easier. So one of the ones is uh, we were working uh, with our partners, so Fugo, uh, Fugo Marine here in Australia, and particularly their, uh, their Spark uh, Center. So this is the Remote Operations Command and Control Facility. Um, we also had support from the state government with some seed funding just to kind of establish that program and help us connect this program out with the community um, here in Western Australia and beyond, uh, as well as AROSE, the Remote Operations for Space and Earth. It's an industry-led consortium. Uh, we were part of the founding partners uh, that um, put, put that sort of together in the sense of unifying Australia's, and in particular Western Australia's, remote operations capability, unifying that in lots of different sectors and bringing it together and helping us um, um, pave towards the moon, and of course, having a having um, I guess a process to bring that those benefits back down to earth. So they were our collaborators here in Australia. 
We also worked uh, with ESA, with ground control, uh, mission control. Um, so they were helping us communicate with BINA. ESA is? Oh, the uh, European Space yeah. Agency. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also worked with the Japanese uh, through a company called uh, Space BD, uh, Space Business Development. And that's the sort of branch of, of JAXA, the Japanese Space Exploration um, uh, Agency. And, and that's all around being able to get, you know, satellites like ours on ride shares, um, and secondary payloads of the uh, JAXA resupply mission to ISS. So they were amazing working side by side with them. It really was one team across two countries in that respect, getting us, you know, um, through all the technical and the reg legislation and all of the legal work. I mean, the paperwork alone for this launch weighs twice as much as the actual spacecraft we have here, uh, or that's actually in space in the end. So um, an enormous amount of uh, work has gone into this. And it's been, um, and it, the origins of this program were actually in sort of honors and PhD projects. We have uh, some incredible staff engineers um, who, who came from the Desert Fireball Network. Um, and so, you know, that, uh, with, you know, a couple of them with uh, a few of our uh, wider space science and technology members um, who have done space missions as well. We've got uh, someone who um, built, uh, he's built uh, instruments that are now on the surface of Mars and on Titan. So we've got some heritage around how to do this. Um, but it's, of course, when you're doing it um, yourself, scratch built, um, it, it does, it, it's an extraordinary process and have everything lined up is just amazing. Well, the one of the themes that you will recall ran through in the zone conferences and really almost everything the center does is that these really complex issues cannot be handled by ourselves alone, by one country alone, by one institution alone. And so the fact that you're working together with the Europeans, that you're working very close together with the Japanese, together with NASA, yes. you know, uh, it, it really gives you a sense for the, the, the level of coordination cooperation needed. In the end, that's our fundamental theme, right? We're, we're as an institution dedicated to improving understanding cooperation between us and our partners in the Indo-Pacific, and that extends clearly to the, the bounds of space <laughs> in that, that process. Uh, let's go back to Australia a little bit then too. Um, there's been some big developments since you last spoke for us back in 2018. That we now have a our own space agency. So tell us a little bit about space in Australia, where you kind of see uh, where we are so far and where we're going. Um, yeah, so we have a space agency about three and a half years old now. Um, and what's, uh, I guess what they were trying, you know, initially trying to do is set up an agency. So we have a front door um, uh, for international cooperation and to kind of lift our space sector and provide those opportunities for the workforce and for industry. Um, the one thing though, that still we probably could have a little bit more room for improvement is the role that research and universities can play in this ecosystem. And when we talk about about international cooperation, we talk about our own capacity as a country um, to be able to meet the needs of, 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 I guess, industries, national security, critical infrastructure, all of these really important elements to our livelihood here in Australia today and in the future. We really need to make sure we've got a strong base, and I think space is an important part of this, um, in provides that inspiration, that lift and that opportunity to really get people on board with STEM as a part of our life, as an enabler, um, but, you know, getting those critical STEM skills um, into the workforce so we can meet the demands that are facing us today in Australia and in the region. And so one thing with, with space, I guess we'd like to see more of is the role of research within this ecosystem. Mm. And what we mean by that is, you know, we, we just shared our, our collaborations on this mission as a space mission. And we look at some of our partners. I mean, the US with NASA is just an incredible example where um, blue sky research, engineering, this the nature of a space mission is just the cornerstone of their economic engine in providing really good um, returns back to the US. So we we're seeing that um, even in 2019, there was an incredible report done um, and it showed that the investment into NASA, which is about 21 billion, um, within that same year brought back 63 billion back to the US, um, the, uh, the US economy. So we're looking at a three to one return within a one mm. year. And we know that's so much bigger across a longer term, uh, the life of some of these innovations. So we know that these things are not a waste of money, they make money. So we're seeing that research is sort of getting left behind the blue sky element to the complement 
of where we want to have that applied science and um, technology go into commercialization to really drive our innovation engine here in Australia. We've got to make sure that we don't leave basic research behind and particularly with space, the, you know, the business of NASA, a lot of that is, is through planetary science. So let me, um, you may recall uh, that just last month or a month before last, now that we're in November, uh, uh, there was a meeting, meeting of the leaders of the Quad. Uh, so <laughs> the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. And among the many announcements of areas that they announced they're working together on, from, from vaccines to, to global supply chains to climate change, was space, space and technology cooperation. And you've indicated that sometimes we get focused on the technology, we forget the basic research. Um, we've already talked about the tremendous work that's going on together with the U.S. and with Japan. I'm curious about your views on India, and then more broadly, on what is it you would like to see if we're going to have cooperation between countries like the Quad on space and space technology? Where would you like to see it go? Oh, fabulous. What, what a question. All righty. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so with respect to our cooperations in the region. So, I mean, Japan is a really gorgeous example. I mean, obviously, immediately with Bin Awan and the work that we did um, across those um, those borders. But we've been involved with um, JAXA missions for a while now. So their return sample um, missions, the Hayabusa 1 and 2, we we will be, we have from their first mission um, samples, you know, right here um, in our labs uh, and we'll with the, the, the next one um, that's just come back, the, the Hayabusa 2 as well. Um, and so we were also on the ground working side by side um, with with those members, with JAXA in the desert in Australia in the um, the mission where we were basically watching it come back down and we were getting the capsule. Um, and so your that's, fireball network detected the re-entry of... Hey, yeah, exactly absolutely. Right. And we also, um, and it be, again, like because of science, because of our research, because of planetary is, you know, the underpinnings of these space missions, we were able to collaborate um, with Japanese universities of which um, had payloads on, on this mission and had instruments that they needed to do. And so we were the a, a trusted Australian science partner for Japan in that. So we actually led the academic endeavours within um, the Hayabusa 2 campaign. So we're really proud of that. And it was actually NASA that and you know, advocated for you know the space science and technology centres. Um, uh, I guess you know inclusion on that because we we understood what science was driving this mission. And so we're seeing that if we can talk this international language of the science and the technology that underpins these missions, then you're going to be able to, you know, connect and sit at the table in these international collaborations when we talk about space. Similarly to India, they have done some breathtakingly brilliant space missions and what they've been able to do um, on a very different scale of budget is just so brilliant if we think about, for example, you know, in the US, um, for example, you know, and they drive... Uh, a lot of their missions are science science driven as well, and so you know if you think about the capacity that we have, um, I guess the capabilities first of, of of having research and science be able to be that kind of international um, you know branch of connection of being able to get like even if it's a small instrument, a, a payload that's Australian built, that we can provide strategic knowledge gaps because of our research and because of that instrument and put it on an international space mission. I mean. That's still an amazing win, right? And you're bringing the inspiration of that endeavor. You don't have to build the whole mission from scratch. You don't have to organize the ride. You, you literally are jumping on board already an international collaborative um, endeavor. And so I think we, we, we cannot remove the role that that inspirational and aspirational goal can play in moving so many bright young things to want to orientate themselves towards STEM careers and to get involved, as well as, I guess, from a almost like a science diploma point of view, you're actually being able to sit at the table with your international friends in the endeavours of science and be able to participate in that way. And we know that model works because we have economic studies um, and the impacts, you know, across lots of different agencies year on year that show that this is an engine that can drive so much benefits for the wider economy, so many benefits for wider society. And we are increasing our knowledge. And that's just absolutely incredible. So your, your, your response is... In, in is uh, inspired me to add a new segment to these conversations, <laughs> which is, you know, disprove the meme or respond to the meme. One of, one of the earliest kind of internet memes I remember seeing, uh, and I'm not sure it was a formal meme or not too, was this notion that 
that NASA spent 10 years and, and $50 million to, to develop a ballpoint pen that would flow in the river. <laughs> and then and the, the cheeky response is, the Russians used a pencil. A pencil. Uh, but the reality is there's also an awful lot of research and science and all the benefits that flowed from that too. So I'm, I'm curious as to your response to that meme. <laughs> oh, I bet that, that, that. Yeah, the pencil oh, versus the the, the 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 zero gravity ballpoint pen. <laughs> Where oh are the merits? Goodness. Well, I would I would say you know you know from a from an economic point of view, how many dro- how many jobs, how much growth did that ballpoint pen yeah, write yeah, yeah, yeah. as as we went on the page, and then with every other person that picked it up, what kind of spirit of exploration and inspiration did that pen give? So um, again, I think it, yeah, it is very funny looking at some of the solutions um, that are derived from that um, demand of a harsh environment, right? And so I guess that's the thing when you set out to do something um, like blue sky research, I mean, you just know that you just know that there are going to be benefits that come from that. The pursuit of knowledge and then the, um, I guess, the outcomes of the technology and then the innovation that drive all of that are only the good things that come back from that. Now, in addition to your work with the Australian American Leadership Dialogue, I know you've been, you've been coordinating kind of the, the youth leadership dialogue efforts. Uh, you were selected to join the International IVLP, International Visitors Leadership Program, and tour the United States. Uh, t- get, tell me a little bit about that, your experience, and any of the takeaways you might have had from that. Yeah, so this is this is going to be a fun one. So um, there was a comp. I haven't actually gone on the physical tour yet. So I went oh, really? all the way up to. Um, really? Yeah. So so interestingly, um, I was pregnant at the time. So I was actually pregnant at the time of our um, in the zone conference, um, which I would have, uh, which I was grateful to be there because I would have. I, I was I was going to note and this is probably inappropriate. We might have to cut it out. But you know, we weren't concerned about fireballs dropping during the conference. Yeah. That's what we were concerned about. <laughs> it was. And the, the, the other, um, the, the host as well, she was pregnant she as well. She was indeed Ash, Ash from, That's from right. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so, so, yeah, um, so it wasn't to be. Um, I guess um, it was just going to cut it too close. The, the context of being in the U.S. T- um, very close to term, um, I think, was, was going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, and so I wasn't able to fulfill that particular um, tour. Um, and then, of course, COVID has prevented the subsequent tours. So hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, next year. Um, but what was really interesting was the process getting to that point. And what for me was was just incredibly humbling was to, to see that there's a role to play in the context of outreach and being able to advocate for um, planetary research and STEM in the community and being able to connect with other you know emerging leaders around the world on that. For me, that was that was incredible, and I think being able to take you know even those those early lessons in that process um, and put that sort of back into the work that we're doing here in WA was, was a really great thing. Well, I'm glad this conversation didn't have to, to turn to a discussion of the American healthcare system, which is probably one of the reasons why we're glad you're here in WA and your child is doing well. Um, look, I want to turn this back to to WA industry, um, and, and um, I had a, 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 an interesting experience and beyond watching stars and drinking Tang. Um, uh, early on in my tenure here in Perth, I was honored to join a sister city delegation to Houston. And they took us down to Johnson Space Center and we got to sit in the, the original mission control for the Apollo missions. That, and I got to sit in the director's chair, which was really cool. And there's an astronaut that let us kind of crawl around one of the training uh, modules for the International Space Station. But having toured that, it was very, very impressive. I came back and two weeks later, I toured the Rio Tinto Remote Operations Center out by Perth Airport, uh, and it struck me that it seemed to be, by orders of magnitude, more modern and more high-tech than the Mission Control Center for the National Space Station was at the time. And part of it you've already referred to, given your work in the fireball next to it, that if you're working out in the Pilbara somewhere, you might as well be on the moon. Yes. Right? Uh, um, what are the unique skills and capabilities that we are developing here in Australia, in WA in particular, that have implications for space? Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it's a completely different model in the sense of putting it on its head. So you would have seen that room full um, of, of, of brilliant minds all working in, in you know, concert with technology, um, all for one bit of exquisite tech or one big, beautiful robot. And so I think what we see here, uh, what is just another day in WA is the flip. One person behind a huge console that has lots of information effectively um, running lots of different robots and lots of complicated systems. And so that's the power of remote operations in, in the way in which it's solving business problems here in WA. 
And WA is known for being innovators in the sense that um, we are a really unique place here. Um, and there's a lot of jobs that can be really, you know, dangerous, really dusty, really dull as well. Um, and we're doing them at distance. And so the nature of how we solve that and what technologies and how you integrate teams and then systems to kind of underpin all of that, this is remote operations. And so what's fascinating is now we're saying, okay, how do we do this at scale? Um, as we roll out the Artemis mission, as we do the um, moon to Mars with an international audience, bringing all these different technologies uh, and different teams together. So what are the different digital handshakes that we're using? What are the types of technologies that are going to be used to be able to do these things at scale and at distance? And I think that's what's really exciting, particularly I, I can imagine from the international space community turning around and being like, how do they do that every day? It's just another day in WA. And so for us to be able to unlock what those elements are and being able to then apply them to the problems in space, that's a really fascinating opportunity here for WA. And another really fascinating thing um, that we can provide to the community. And it's actually a benefit in the sense that we're a little late to the party and having a formal you know, um, space agency as one of, um, uh, you know, a, a developed and advanced economy in the world. But really what that means is that we can start to understand where do we, where are we heavy hitting, right? So where, do, where are we world leading? Um, and we know that there is world-class remote operations here in WA. And I think if we can understand how to unlock that and apply it to space, not only will that benefit the international community as we continue to go on and, uh, you know, pursue an uh, ongoing and sustained presence in the moon on the way to Mars, but also bring all those benefits back so we can give our kids here in WA a new outlook and a new identity about what it means to be growing up here in this great state. It's nice to see the extension of the, the, the tagline. It's just another day in WA taking a size. <laughs> Although I know that the, the, you can tell you're in WA when the, the traditional dirty, dangerous, and dull has been shifted to dangerous, dusty, and dull. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, you spent some time out there. <laughs> oh, not nearly <laughs> as enough as I should, but um, it is. It's very, very fascinating. And it's the seed of which a rose grew from. Well, let me, let me ask a final question, if I might. Um, uh, I was fortunate to be in, in the United States in September and, and really fortunate to be in Washington, D.C. during a very historic week when there was an announcement of Osmin, which is the two plus two ministerials, which uh, an unprecedented level of, of integration and cooperation between the United States and Australia. There was the announcement of AUKUS, this Australia, uh, UK, US technology sharing agreement. And all of our discourse is focused on the submarine, but it's really about technology. Mm -hmm. And then there was the quad leaders meeting, the first time ever in meeting. Pretty big week. Uh, what did you pull from those from that week when it when it comes to space, when it comes from technology? Yeah. What are the, what's the potential there that you see? Oh my goodness. Well, I mean, to be to be honest, where I went was human capital. Right. So I'm looking at this from a context of, you know, how do we how do we bring um, the thing that underpins all of this? So STEM, we know STEM underpins so many of the technologies that are fundamental to those discussions that you're in. And I guess for me, I'm thinking about. So what are the ways we're going to inspire people today and the next generation to step up, to stand tall and meet some of these challenges, as well as the opportunities that have been outlined within these incredible structures um, and announcements um, just, just recently. So for me, again, when I think about space, yes, there's going to be some direct, I guess, like the technology transfer and being able to do business in the context of science and technology a little bit easier from country to country and um, across those um, organizations. But really, again, you know, coming back to it, space is so unique. It's one of, um, you know, I guess one of the most unique investments, you know, a government can make that not only brings your return on your investment, but can help with inspiration and change the identity of your people. And I just think that, you know, being able to look at space, yes, as an enabler, we know that so many technologies can benefit um, and vice versa. So spin ups as well as spin downs, um, particularly when we talk about defense, typically when we talk about, you mentioned remote operations as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of remote operations that are going into um, the, the, the Australian Defense Force. Um, we, know, we know that technology is pivotal um, to this, the lines in the sand that are being drawn here on the world stage. Right. So we need to make sure that not only we have the technology, we actually have the people, because that's one of the greatest investments a country can make in. Well, your final reference there to inspiration, 
Uh, really sparked this conversation. I saw you again in the, in the middle of the winter on the Australian American Leadership Dialogue on a panel with Shadow Foreign Minister Penny Wong, and you made the point: inspiration it matters. You, it kind of provides the fuel for so much of the other collaboration we do. And you certainly have been inspirational for us today. Thank you. Um, Quick question, when's the next launch of the next uh, BNR? When's, it, when's the plan? Yeah, so at the moment we're heading towards late next year. Um, so there's a handover hopefully um, mid next year uh, and then looking at the launch uh, for yeah quarter three, late quarter three or early quarter four next year. Um, and what's really fascinating is that whilst we're celebrating BNR1, um, the launch as well as the deployment out of the ISS uh, and subsequently us talking with BNR, on orbit, um, we're in the middle of our, um, we just completed our, our preliminary design review for mission two, three, and four. So we're gonna have space available of these spacecrafts for student projects. We're gonna continue iterating our software and hardware that has been you know, driven by our students. Uh, and we wanna make this platform open and available for school kids um, as well as for startups because access to space is not just um, getting getting there on a rocket, it's also the, the cost of your spacecraft. So we're really proud to have the BINAR platform, um, you know, I guess open and available for further collaborations to enable so much more. Research Ambassador <laughs> Renee Sayers, thank you so much for this conversation. And whether you're watching this from here in Australia, from the United States, from India, Japan, or anywhere else in the Indo-Pacific, watch this space. There's a lot coming down here. I'd like to continue the conversation, but I have a deep hankering for a cup of tang and I've got to go find it. So <laughs> thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Pleasure. <laughs>